New figures out from the United Nations Refugee Agency have revealed record numbers of people were forced to flee their homes last year because of war or persecution. And the figures are staggering. More than 70 million people were displaced. Now, most refugees come from Syria. The war there has forced nearly 7 million people to leave the country. Afghanistan, South Sudan, Myanmar, and Somalia also saw millions leaving because of conflict and persecution. Now, where are they going? Well, Turkey tops the list of host countries with 3.7 million people, followed by Pakistan, Uganda, and Sudan. Germany is fifth on the list with more than 1 million refugees. We take a closer look now at Uganda and ask why this country has be, been more welcoming to refugees than some others. Seam by seam, stitch by stitch, Edith Phoney is making a new dress. She recently trained as a seamstress as part of a UN refugee aid project. In 2016, she fled with her family from war-torn South Sudan to Uganda. On our way here, the rebels came. They took our property, tortured us in different ways and beat us. Like millions of others from South Sudan, Edith and her family found refuge in Uganda. Refugee aid here functions differently. People aren't simply confined to a camp like in Kenya. Refugees who arrive here are immediately given a work permit and land, which is provided by the communities and their new neighbours. They also receive monthly benefits. We have cash and food as well. Because when we give them food, their diet is restricted to the food that we've given them. But when you give them cash, they have the option to buy and supplement whatever their, their, their diet is. So it's optional. Ugandans have a strong willingness to give to those in need. For 20 years, they also suffered during the civil war. They also benefit from international aid, which can be used to build hospitals or schools. But of course, there are still challenges. As a young school, we have enormous challenges. One of it is the infrastructure, like the classrooms are not enough. We don't have science laboratories. We don't have library, though we have the books, but we have nowhere to put them. Then also the teachers move from far distance to come here, so there are no staff quarters. Then also the students, especially the girl child, move from far distance to come and learn in this school. Norbert Avuma's school is in a Jumani district in the north of the country. 400,000 people live here. Half of them are refugees, some of whom arrived here 50 years ago. Many are from South Sudan, where the most recent civil war broke out in 2013. It's led to an ongoing conflict between rival factions. Titus Jogo, the refugee officer in the district, is happy that the refugees were able to find a new place to call home in Uganda. He believes it benefits the locals too. The presence of the so many NGOs means so many people have been employed, not, not necessarily from this district, but elsewhere, and we pay tax. When you look at the infrastructure development, we have constructed accessible roads in the refugee settlements, we have constructed schools, we have constructed health centers. But there are also negative aspects. Resources like wood supplies are dwindling. In January this year, almost 6,000 more refugees arrived in Uganda. But it wants to keep its borders open and can only manage this influx with the help of aid money, at least for the time being. As Uganda's policies continue to be put into action, it's hoped that refugees will become self-sufficient, like seamstress Edith Phoney. And joining me now here in the studio to discuss this is the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grande. Thank you so much and welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, you said it yourself, this number, more than 70 million people displaced around the world. Shocking. Why do you think it is still growing? It's the symptom of a world without peace. Even more specifically, a world in which we have become unable to make peace. Look at the images we've just watched in Uganda. The influx of refugees in Uganda is due to mainly two conflicts, one in South Sudan, the other one in Congo. And uh, unless we become more efficient in stopping wars, 
we will continue this see this figure growing and becoming bigger. I want to talk a little bit more about the atmosphere toward refugees right now because we have some governments closing borders, um, building walls, even paying other governments in order uh, to take in refugees. I'm thinking about Turkey specifically. Your response? Well, uh, my response is that restrictions, closures, pushbacks are not only wrong. Let's remember that these people are fleeing from war, conflict, violence, discrimination. So they need help. So it's not only wrong to push them back, but it is also not efficient. The problem will not go away. It will just move to another part of the world. It will be a problem there. And it is just waiting to come back to the rich countries. I want to talk about a bit about those attitudes, though, that are out there, because, I mean, you know, we, we have um, attitudes really deteriorating, not only toward refugees, but also toward immigrants in, in recent years, um, seen as a burden on the system. Um, how do you change that mindset? I mean, has there been a failure here in managing the message in terms of what refugees bring to the table for various countries? There have been many failures in managing these population movements. We have to recognize that. Um, in Europe, for example, they were designed for much smaller numbers. When the numbers became bigger in 2015, Europe was not ready. And that sent a wrong message. But also some unscrupulous politicians have exploited that. They have realized that by portraying these people as a threat, they would gain consensus and votes. Now, this is the wrong approach, as I said. This doesn't solve the problem. Uh, I am always a bit hesitant to present this figure as dramatic. It is dramatic, of course. 70 million people in need of uh, protection, of safety. It's dramatic. But it is also manageable. We're 7.5 billion people on this planet. It, surely, we can find ways, like Uganda did, to manage these flows. When it comes to your organization, the UNHCR, um, we know that the United States is um, among the largest supporters of refugees. Um, the U.S., in, in fact, is the biggest single donor to the UNHCR. We've seen the rhetoric from U.S. President Donald Trump. It does not seem to be friendly toward your organization. Are you worried? Well, uh, I would not say that it is not friendly to my organization because, uh, I, like you said, the United States government is a very generous supporter of refugee operations worldwide. The discussion which is more complicated is about refugees in the United States. That's a complicated discussion, as it is in Europe. But uh, this has not uh, jeopardized the incredibly strong support, including financial support, that the U.S. has provided to us and other, many NGOs and others, working with refugees around the world. Um, your organization, the UNHCR, you seem to be a bit of a fig leaf um, for countries around the world. Um, do you find that you are still able to do the work that you were commissioned to do from the very beginning? I mean, what, what are your frustrations these days when it comes to executing your mission? I think, um, if I may, we're not a fig leaf. Uh, I have 16,000 colleagues, most of whom are in very far away, far away from here, field locations, working day in, day out to bring relief, to bring safety to the millions of people that are fleeing conflict, together with many other partners. Their work continues to be relevant and important. What frustrates me is, of course, this environment, this toxic environment that stigmatizes, um, criticizes, uh, portrays refugees, migrants, sometimes even foreigners, as the enemy. This is, uh, like I said, easy to, 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 to spread. It's a line that many people embrace because they have apprehensions and fears, but it is not a good line. Why are they not the enemy? Perhaps you can bust some of those myths for us right now. Well, first of all, like I said, let's not forget that these are people fleeing problems. They're not bringing problems. So they're not the enemy in that sense. Then, of course, they move along with many other people, migrants and people moving for other reasons. That's make, that makes it more complicated to manage, but it is possible to manage it in a manner that uh, 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 regulates. This requires some responsibility sharing between countries, which we don't see much of these days, but also in this manner, 
the, what these people can offer to countries hosting them becomes positive. These people can be invaluable contributors to, to the economy, to the society, even to the values of countries that receive them generously. As we heard from your report, um, this is the seventh consecutive year um, that the number of displaced people around the, the world has been on the rise. How do you see the next seven years developing? And, and are there perhaps any silver linings, any areas in which you are seeing progress? We have now um, something called the Refugee Compact. This is an agreement between the countries in the world to improve the manner in which we respond to refugee crisis. It was very interesting what we heard just a few minutes ago from Uganda, because Uganda is a model country in that respect. It, it uh, receives refugees, it keeps borders open, and God knows what a burden it is for them. Millions from South Sudan, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And yet people are not put in camps, they're allowed to access services, they're allowed to work. But of course, that model, which we are promoting, needs a lot of support. Uganda doesn't have all the resources, as we heard from that teacher. So we should not take for granted that hospitality. We should support it. And in that way, I think that if that model is replicated, and we're doing it in about 15 countries these, these days, we have a new blueprint for a better um, support model to refugee crisis. This is a reason for optimism amidst the gloom and amidst the fears. So a shocking report, but some hope for the future. Joining us with that perspective, we thank you very much, Filippo Grande, High Commissioner for Refugees at the United Nations. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.